Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. I want to welcome you all here to Finley Lake Church. If you are a guest or a visitor, we are so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Dave Cook, and it's uh, always such a joy to gather together for worship. Um, if you're a guest, we would love for you to fill out the welcome card and place that in the offering basket, the white offering box that's in the hallway, just so we can know who you are and serve you better. And uh, just have to say again what a blessing it is to have so many new people, new faces in our church family. And uh, we just pray that you are finding a, a home uh, where you experience the love and the grace of Jesus. And um, that's our prayer here, is that we are just an authentic, faithful group of misfit disciples that Jesus works in to transform us into people he can use to bring hope and truth and grace to the world around us. And so if there's any way that I can help you connect, uh, feel free to reach out, and I'd love to touch base with you. So before we enter into worship, as we enter into worship, I'd like to share Psalm 100. I love this passage as a call to worship. It reminds us who we are as God's people. Most importantly, it reminds us who God is. And so let's turn our attention to Psalm 100 as we prepare our hearts for worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that we can declare that you are our God and we are your people because of your faithfulness. Because of the grace of Jesus Christ, because of the blood of Jesus, we can come and know you and be forgiven and cleansed of our sins and stand rightly before you and worship you because of who you are and what you've done for us. And so Jesus, as we worship you, as we fix our attention, our loving attention and thoughts on you, we pray that you would captivate and fill our minds. We pray that you would wash our hearts of anything that does not belong and fill our hearts with your love, your peace, your purposes, your joy, and everything that comes from walking with you and experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus, draw us together as one body, as one family. Work within us that we might leave this place filled with your love and ready to go out into the world to proclaim Jesus to all those around us. Holy Spirit, fall afresh upon us now. We need your healing power. We need your saving power. We need your, um, the, the newness and the, the vibrance of, of faith and life that comes from you. So come and have your way with us. Most of all, Jesus, we pray that you would be pleased and glorified and lifted up here in this place and here in our hearts. We pray all of this in your wonderful name and all God's people said, amen. This morning, our scripture is out of 1 Kings 18, verses 21 through 22 and then 30 through 39. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant 
and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And he is today. And may the blessing of the Lord be on this reading. Well, this morning we are in week three in this series called Altered, and uh, hopefully you've all uh, gotten the play on words that we want to be altered, we want to be changed at the altar. Not necessarily just a wooden altar like this, but even our hearts can become an altar as we make space to to experience and encounter the living God and His grace. Um, We've been saying throughout this series, uh, this series based on a book by Susan Kent, that space plus surrender equals shift. Making space for God experiencing his presence, his power, his grace by making a space, whether that's coming to a physical altar or whether that's kneeling right where we are, whether that's making our bedside an altar, making space for God plus surrendering our hearts to him equals a shift in our spiritual lives. He changes us. He makes us new. He, could, he makes it so we're able to come alive. And so we want to focus throughout this series on different altars that were made for the Lord and how God worked in the lives of people um, at those altars. And uh, may we be people who are changed as we make, make space for the Lord wherever we find ourselves, where we surrender ourselves to him and where we experience his transforming power. So this may sound like a joke, but it's not. Uh, Recently, I found out that my grandfather was in the CIA, or actually the precursor to the CIA, whatever that might be. I mean, I thought my grandfather had a boring lawyer job, and I I think that's mostly what he did, but um, he was in the the, the forerunner or whatever, the precursor to the CIA back in the 1940s, um, around the time of World War II. And I just learned this stuff. Again, I thought he was a Methodist layman, not much exciting going on, um, but I discovered I had never known that he had held a gun before, but uh, evidently he won awards in pistol marksmanship. Um, when, when he and my grandmother would wash his clothes and hang them out to dry, they would always make sure to hang those out at night um, to make sure that nobody could see anything that would give away that he was, it's kind of getting good, isn't it? Um, they kind of <laughs> kind of make sure that uh, those clothes would be washed in, and dried, you know, in a, in a secret place so nobody would, would have any idea as to his identity or, or what he was doing. And, uh, you know, anyway, that's about all I know. That's probably safer that way for me and for you. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, um, here's, here's the bottom line, I think, with what he was doing. It was a time of World War II when the atomic bomb was being created, and it was very important that when so much was at stake in a time of war, uh, when the atom bomb is being created, it was very important that the government knew whose hearts were loyal to the country and who, have, who may have been trying to infiltrate the, infiltrate the ranks and, and spy on these secrets, get their hands on sensitive information, um, because so much was at stake. So as an intelligence agent, I think he did it for a very short time, but he was examining people, he was investigating people to make sure that their hearts we're loyal. When it comes to our spiritual lives, it's so important that we investigate our hearts, that we examine ourselves to pay attention to any competing loyalties that are going on within us so that we can make sure that, that a false god or an idol is not vying for space and attention within our hearts that should be re- reserved for God and God alone. Your life makes a huge impact on the lives of others. Hopefully not like an atom bomb, although for two-year-olds, that's probably the case. But your life has a huge impact on the people around you. And so the loyalties and the the gods that are at war, the gods that are competing for the throne of your heart, that has huge implications on the impact you will have on other people. The the, the life that you live, the, the story of your life, and whether it's a story of faithfulness, whether it's a story that, and a life that points people to Jesus, or whether it's a story that, that, that makes people cynical, or that makes people angry. And it's important to remember, we are all imperfect works of grace. You know, we are, we are um, in progress. We are, we are unfinished. 
And so there's always grace, there's always forgiveness, but we want to become people who are learning to say yes to Christ and no to any other false god or idol that would vie for the throne of our hearts. Just like last Sunday, we're spending another week on idolatry. Last week, we looked at Abraham and Isaac and how Abraham was called to surrender Isaac. Um, Fortunately, God did not have him go through with that. It was just a test. But we looked at the importance of surrendering it all, surrendering our hearts. And today, we're looking at how we want God to renew our faith as we look at Elijah the prophet. This week, my family was on vacation. We stopped at Asbury University, and we heard a, a, a phenomenal talk at the Asbury University Chapel about our loves. Looking at idolatry, but from the context of competing loves. And, and it was really, it was really eye-opening to think about. And he, he talked a lot about Augustine, one of the church fathers. If you remember Augustine, he talked about how really the key to faith and the key to relationships is having our loves in the right order. That when we have disordered loves, loves that are out of order and misprioritized, it brings a whole lot of destruction and chaos. But when our hearts are rightly ordered, and the love in our hearts is rightly ordered, we're on a much better path. But the, the speaker was Kevin Brown, the, the president of the, the university, and he said this, that faith is not only a matter of the mind and what we believe, but faith is a matter of the heart and what we love. And the transforming power of Jesus within us should not just renew our minds so that we think differently, But if we are really surrendering all, the Holy Spirit will be working within us so that our loves are being reprioritized. Our loves are being changed so that we begin to love more and more what God loves. And we learn to reject or say no more and more to those powers, to those loves that are not of God. And so that's really important for us to think about. What has a growing attraction in my heart? What is taking on a greater, a greater attraction? What is gaining more and more of my attention? If I were to investigate, think about my grandfather, if we were investigating and examining our lives, what would that investigation show about what we love in terms of our attention, in terms of our checkbook, in terms of our internet searches, in terms of um, where where we are putting all of our energy and our time what are the things that our, that our hearts are growing in love for? And what are the things that we, sh- we should be squeezing out but are threatening to take over? What do you love? What's becoming a more dominant focus in your life? As we think about idolatry, before we get to Elijah, I want to share a few words by Pastor Kyle Eidelman, who wrote a great book called Gods at War, talking about these, how God, <laughs> the, the one true living God, um, wants, to, wants to be on the throne of our hearts, and yet so often there are these false gods, gods with little g's, that are vying for that place in our heart. And listen to what Kyle Eidelman writes. He says, the gods are at war, and their strength is not to be underestimated. The gods clash for the throne of your heart, and much is at stake. Everything about me, everything I do, every relationship I have, every hope or dream or wish to become depends upon what God wins that war. Do you see how a lot is at stake? When your heart's going and loving and moving in the right direction, a lot of people are blessed. Your life is blessed. Your your life is at peace. When your heart is off track, loving the wrong things, not loving the right things, you can see how that leads to a lot of pain and a lot of confusion and a lot of chaos and a lot of hurt. The gods clash for the throne of your heart and much is at stake. He goes on. What if it's not about statues? You know, we think about Baal, we think about statues and all of that. What if it's not about statues, he writes? What if we do our kneeling and our bowing with our imaginations, our checkbooks, our search engines, our calendars? Every sin you are struggling with, every discouragement you face, even the purpose you lack, he writes, is because of idolatry. He says idolatry is the true illness that manifests in a variety of symptoms. We think that our symptoms are the problem, when in reality the symptoms flow from the true illness, which is idolatry. So if, I, if idolatry is the, the sin sickness or the sickness, that leads to a whole lot of symptoms. So he writes this, he explains it this way. You think what you have is a lust problem, but what you really have is a worship problem. 
The question you have to answer each day is, will I worship God or will I worship sex? And he goes on and on in a variety of categories, whether that's, will I worship God or money? Will I worship God or my own image? Will I worship God or my reputation? And, and the list goes on and on and on. And, and that's just like what Jesus said when he was teaching about money, and he said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. You will either love the one and hate the other, or, you'll, or vice versa, because there's not room in our hearts to have two gods. We need to learn to make, our, make God our one true God and to squeeze out the idols and the false gods that vie for the throne. And, and the reason is, is because God is a jealous God. When God led the people out of slavery in Egypt and gave the, the law, the Ten Commandments to Moses, what was the first one? I'm the God who led you out of slavery in Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm the one who's demonstrated my faithfulness. I, I'm the one who's demonstrated my power to save you. You shall have no other gods before me. When we look at idolatry in the scriptures, I said this last week, idolatry is, is spiritual adultery. It's like infidelity. And, and just to, to focus on that as an issue for a moment, more than one-third of all divorces in America cite infidelity as the cause of the broken relationship. So in other words, either one or both people shifted the focus of their affection, they shifted the focus of their love and commitment to someone else, and it caused a fracture in a relationship. And, and it makes a lot of sense on a marriage level, and on this, in the same way, it makes a lot of sense on a spiritual level, that if our minds and our hearts are wholehearted towards God, we're going to have a growing, vibrant relationship with God. But if our hearts are adulterous, if we're, if we're um, committing infidelity in terms of allowing other gods to vie for the throne of our hearts. It's going to cause a fracture. It's going to cause um, a relational breakdown in our walk with Jesus. And we're not going to live victorious lives of joy and peace and purpose and move forward and be all in for Christ. But we're going to be weighed down. We're going to be, our hearts are going to be divided. We're, that, a good word for that is duplicity. It's not living a life of integrity, but it's being one place, or one way in one place. It's being another way in another place. And that's not what the Lord desires. The Lord desires that we would be wholehearted, that we would be the same person when we're worshiping Jesus that we are when we're with our family or that we are with, when we're with our friends or we are when we are alone. God's not wanting us to be wholehearted and divided. And who wants to live that way anyway? Who wants that, that shame and that secrecy of, oh, I'm, I'm not the same person in all circumstances? But that's what happens when we chase after all the idols because we're trying to worship one idol or one God in one place and another idol somewhere else. And the Lord says, no, that's not how it should be. Get rid of the idols and live for me above all else. We need to investigate our loyalties. Charles Spurgeon said in his devotional called Morning and Evening, he said this, a jealous God will not be content with a divided heart. He must be loved first and best. That's a really great, great quote for us. Do I love Jesus first and do I love him best? One quick verse before we get into Elijah in 1 Kings 18. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. My attitude, the words I use towards my family, the words I use wherever I go, how I treat people, that's all flowing from my heart. And so this proverb says, guard your heart, and that means examine it, Think about it, reflect on it, because a whole lot of people are impacted by the condition of my heart. So guard your heart because everything we do, everything we say, flows from our hearts. And so we want to get rid of any idols in our hearts so we can live wholeheartedly for God. So let's dive into our passage from 1 Kings chapter 18. We're looking at Elijah the prophet. Before we get into the story, I just want to remind us about the three offices that we see in the Old Testament, the three public offices. There was prophet, priest, and king. And we think in our day, oh, king is the most important because that's the ruler. Well, not really. Actually, the prophet was the most important office. But there's the prophet who does what? He speaks for God to the people. So the prophet is like a mediator between God and people, but speaks God's word, God's truth to the people. The priest is also a mediator as an Old Testament office, but it's the priest speaking for the people to God. So the priest would go and make the sacrifices and bring the offerings for the people to God. 
and then the king would be the ruler. All of these offices were anointed as, as one entered into it, and then we see that Jesus is the anointed one. This is just a little extra. Jesus is anointed one. Christ means anointed one, and Jesus is the great fulfillment as a prophet, priest, and king, but that's not where we're, we're really going. But I set that up to say that Elijah was a prophet, and we're going to look at King Ahab and the relationship that was going on here that was causing Israel to fall into a place of idolatry. And so as we think about what's happening here, Elijah was a prophet of God as Ahab was a king of Israel's northern kingdom. And King Ahab did something that led Israel down the wrong path. He married Jezebel, a woman from Phoenicia, and he began to worship one of her gods, Baal. I think Gordon said it right, Baal, but I'll just say Baal, it's a little easier. But he began to worship one of her gods, Baal. The image of Baal was a bull which represented productivity and wealth. And so as the people are worshiping Baal, there's really a more foundational God behind it. It's a God of materialism. And that's what the people were worshiping. Ahab, King Ahab, who should have been the one leading everyone spiritually, along with the prophet Elijah, Ahab built an, built an altar to Baal inside of God's temple. And just think about what an offense, what an insult that is to the living God, that in the middle of the temple... King, King Ahab builds a, an idol. He builds a, uh, an altar to Baal. And so the Israelites had gone down the wrong path. They were a people with a divided heart, and they'd been going through the motions of devotion. You know, oh, that God would rid our hearts of any idols because there's nothing worse than, than knowing within, I'm just going through the motions. And if that's us today, if that's you, Jesus wants to call us back that we would be wholehearted, but the people, the Israelites, were going through the motions with a divided heart, not fully committing their, their lives, not fully committing themselves to the living God. And so God sent Elijah to Ahab to proclaim his judgment on him and to draw God's people back to himself. That's a, that's a problem when the king is leading the people down the wrong path. And so Elijah goes before the people and he says this really powerful statement he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? And then he says this, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. Essentially saying, you can't, you can't serve both. So choose who you're going to serve. If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And the people said, nothing. That's a, as we investigate our loyalties, as we examine our hearts, those are really good questions. What am I wavering between, if anything? Am, am I living with a divided heart? Is, is there something that I'm feeding in my life with my attention, my energy, my money, my time, my effort? Is there something in me that I'm feeding that's growing that is not of God? And if so, I need to recognize it and confess it. The problem happens when we, instead of confessing our sin, we, we start to like cradle it and justify it or minimize it or deny it. Um, those are kind of the three standard human responses to sin if we're going down the wrong path of feeding that idol within. Denial, I didn't do it. How many times have we heard this when somebody's going down the wrong path? Denial, minimizing, it's not that big a deal. I can stop any time justifying it. Well, I only did it because of what's going on with that person. They did that, so I'm doing this. You know, they're ignoring me, so I'm putting my attention here. Whatever the case may be, I won't bore you with all the, the excuses. <laughs> We've heard of those. We've heard enough of those. But yeah, justifying our sin, justifying our idolatry, minimizing it, denying it, when really we should be examining ourselves and saying, Lord, I want to be open and honest before you. And so it was time for Elijah to get before the people and say, we need to have a showdown. Which way are you going to go? Are you following Baal? Or are you going to follow God, the one true living God? And so it was time for Elijah to repair the altar. It was time for this ultimate showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah, the one faithful prophet left, and the 450 prophets of Baal. And so the prophets of Baal made an altar, and Elijah was going to make an altar, and it was going to be which which God responds with fire from heaven, which God shows up and, and proves once for all who the one true living God is. And so the prophets of Baal made an altar and they cried out to him and, and they were trying to get his attention. They were shouting. They even went so far as cutting themselves, trying to get their God's attention, but nothing was happening. Elijah 
begins to talk a little smack. Maybe, maybe your God is busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleepy. Shout louder. You know, try to get your God's attention. You know, maybe your God's deep in thought, whatever. They, and, and the people, they just shouted and slashed themselves all the more. And then it was time for Elijah to prepare his altar and to call on his God. You know, it's really sad that Elijah had to repair the, the altar. I wonder how long the altar had been broken down without the people even wondering or worrying, hey, what's up? We need this altar. We need worship. We need to be wholehearted. We need to be all in for God, and yet our altar is destroyed. I don't know how long that went on, but the people had been distracted. But now Elijah would rebuild this altar. But I think about that in our own lives. What is the condition of the altar of our hearts? Are we making space for the living God? How long has it been since we've gotten a position, a, a place of stillness, and said, Lord, I need your presence, I need your grace at work within me? How long has it been since we've been really open with God and we've confessed the thoughts or the actions or the words that have offended God or hurt somebody else? We get so good at putting that wall up and protecting ourselves and justifying our own behavior and hanging on to our anger like a bad habit and hanging on to our bitterness and our unwillingness to forgive. But when was the last time we made that space where we rebuilt an altar in our heart and said, Lord, I want you to examine my life and I want to be real and open and transparent before you. I want you to speak to me about what's right. I want you to speak to me about what needs to change and I want your grace to do the work of bringing cleansing and forgiveness within it was time for Elijah to rebuild the altar. And so he built the altar with stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel. He built a trench for all those seeds. He arranged the wood and placed the, the bowl on top of it. He asked everything to be doused with water several times, which makes the fire all the more remarkable. And Elijah prays, Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that the people will know that you are Lord, that you are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. You know how I talked about how a lot is at stake? That's what's at stake for us. Lord, answer me. Work in my life. Demonstrate your power. Demonstrate your presence within me so that the people around me will know that you are God. I don't know about you. That's the life I want to live. That we would live such an authentic life of grace. That we would not put on some self-righteous persona or anything like that but that the Lord Jesus would be at work in us so authentically and so powerfully that we would be able to pray, Lord, answer me. Work in my life in such a way that the people around me will know that, Lord, you are God and that you've turned my heart to you and you can turn their hearts to you. And so Elijah prays and he calls on God and then we see the Lord's power to consume the sacrifice and the fire of the Lord falls and consumes everything that was offered. And the people's response when they saw this was, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It's an example of what we've been saying for the past few weeks. When we build that altar, when we make space for God, when we surrender and we offer everything, it's an opportunity for us to experience a shift. The spiritual power of, of God to show up and to change our lives and to change our hearts. You know, we can go through the motions time and time again. We can become distracted by other things. We can forget the nature and the goodness of God. But God's calling us to make his space for him, to make an altar before him. See, the, the problem is when the, God, when the gods of materialism or the gods of the false gods take over, we take our focus off the one true living God. And that's when everything starts to go sideways. We take our focus on God and we start trusting in other things or we stop just trusting in God and then we're, we're overcome by fear, we're overcome by worry. Will God provide? Will God show up? Will God get me through this? When we keep our eyes on Jesus, it's, it's an opportunity for us to remember his promises, to remember his faithfulness, to remember that he's worked before and he will work again, to remember the hope that we have for this life and the life to come. So when we take our eyes off Christ, we begin to doubt the truth he has taught us. We doubt God's power. We doubt our relationship with the Lord. Am I loved? Am I, am I saved? Am I in a relationship with the living God? But when we get rid of those false gods and we say, Lord, I want to be all in for you, come and have your way with me, 
our focus on Jesus gets clearer and our hearts become divided rather than undivided. So this renewal of faith happens when we turn our hearts back to the Lord and we place him as the one most central place, the one most central object of our hearts and of our lives. Renewal of faith comes when we say, Lord, forgive me for any idols. Help me to recognize them and discard them, tear them down. And Lord, renew my faith as I place my focus on the truth of who you are and the truth of what you've done in my life. In his letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 4, verses 20 to 24, Paul writes this about a new life. If we want to have our faith renewed, listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul says, put off your old self and be made new in the attitude of your minds. As we start to wrap this up, (laughs) I just want to ask you, where do your loyalties lie? Are you making space for the living God to sit on the throne of your heart and to rule and to guide your life? What God or gods receive your secret attention? What God or gods receive your resources of time and money? What effort do you give to support the place of Christ as the king of your heart? and in your life. You know, here, here's just the reality of life. Whatever we feed, whatever we focus our attention on, it's going to grow. And that's so true in our, in, our, in our relationship with the Lord, and it's not that we drive the process, it's the Holy Spirit working within us, but we want to surrender to the Spirit. But whatever we give our attention to, it's going to grow. And it's going to, if we, whatever we feed is going to grow. And so where do we feed our minds? How do we feed our hearts? How do we feed our minds? Do we feed our minds on God's truth? Do we spend time in fellowship with other people? Do we think about how the Lord wants to work in us each day? Do we wake up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus, this is your day. I am your child. Work in me and through me for your glory. Where do we place our attention? Where do we place our loyalties? And and really the same is true in marriage. You know, do I give my spouse the time, the attention that she deserves? Simply sitting in and, and offering the gift of my presence, my ears. Is she here? I think, yeah, she is. All right. She's going she's gonna to ask. All right, we're going to talk about this after. No, but um, I, always, I always think about, okay, what's Heather thinking? Um, but anyway, the, but the, the truth is, if you feed your marriage by giving somebody time and attention, your marriage is going to grow. You know, so often people say, well, I'm going to follow my heart wherever that leads. And it's like, no, you, you lead your heart by choosing where you're going to invest by choosing where you're going to give your time, by choosing where you're going to give your attention, by choosing what priorities you're going to have. And the same is true for our faith in Christ. If we allow other gods to come in and, and, and just take away and vie for our time and our attention, our lives will go sideways so fast. So if you were under investigation, where do your loyalties lie? The good news is no matter what has had up to this point, our attention, our focus, right now, Jesus says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Do you want that false God to lead you down a path of destruction, a path of um, worry, a path of doubt, a path of insignificance, or do you want to follow me on the path that leads to life? And so let's make Jesus the king of our hearts today. Let's not give our attention to false idols. False idols will come in. The enemy is so sneaky and so subtle. He, he, you know, he doesn't turn us 180 degrees in one day, but just five degrees of change a day can really lead us down the wrong path in a very short time. And Jesus is saying, it's time for you to return to me. I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will make your life new. I will lead you on the path of life, the path of peace, the path of purpose, where you won't be you know, sucked into doubt and worry and other things. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we confess that so often as those gods, false gods, vie for our attention, we give them too much space. We entertain them too much. 
We, give, we allow our, our focus to be taken off you. And so, Lord Jesus, we just want to confess that and we ask for your forgiveness that if there is any idol, any false god, anything vying for control and rule of our hearts, that you would tear down those idols and, Lord Jesus, that you would come and take your rightful place as king of our lives, king of our hearts, king of our families, king of our church. Jesus, we pray that you would help us to worship you and to love you wholeheartedly, not divided, not in a duplicitous way where we serve one God in one place and worship another God somewhere else. Jesus, we want to worship you every moment of every day, no matter where we go. We want to honor you with our lips, with our lifestyles. And so, Jesus, come and have your way with us and be Lord of our lives, not just Savior, where, we, where you forgive our sins, but Lord, we ask for you to truly be Lord and leader and king of our lives. And so, Lord, we say no to any other idol that tries to vie for the throne of our hearts, and we kneel and we bow and we bend our knee before you, knowing what, that one day every knee, every, every tongue will confess, every knee, every knee will bow, every person will declare that you are Lord, that you are Savior. But Jesus, until we meet you face to face, we want to already live with you as our King and as our God. Jesus, we pray for anyone here whose life has been hurt because of some other God that's had its way. And whether that brings shame or whether that brings pain, whether the person is a, is a villain and the God has taken them over and they've hurt other people or God, whether there's someone here who's a victim because another person has wounded them, has taken something, has hurt them, because another God, a false God, was leading that person down the wrong path. Jesus, we just want to acknowledge the hurt that comes when we don't live for you as our King and as our God. And we pray that you would bring healing to anyone here who has been hurt by their actions or the actions of others. And Jesus, as you come and make yourself King in our lives and King of our church and King of our families, we pray that you would reprioritize our loves, that our loves would not be disordered but our loves, the things that we crave, the things that we think about, the things that we go after would be ordered in a way that would bring you glory and in a way that would bring us life, in a way that would bring, make us thrive in our lives, in our faith, in our marriages, in our families, in our friendships. And so Jesus, come and have your way with us. We offer ourselves at the altar of grace. We pray that this would be a space where you work, where you re rearrange any priorities in our hearts so that you can be glorified in us and through us. We pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. My prayer as we go out this week is that we would have hearts of humility that are willing to confess before the Lord each day and, and give the Lord space to examine our loyalties. And uh, I just want to say that, you know, sometimes when there have been false gods vying for control of our hearts, um, they, they don't want to let go. And so, um, I really encourage you, if there is something, if the Lord has been speaking and you know there has been an idol attached to me and I'm saying no to that, um, I encourage you to talk to somebody just because the power of confession uh, brings healing and brings freedom. And so whether it's a trusted friend, whether you want to meet with me, whether there's um, somebody else that you just want to pray with and just confess, this has been vying for control of my heart and I'm saying no more through the power and the grace of Jesus. Find somebody that you can talk to and, and share that because as Rick Warren says, that the revealing of the feeling is the beginning of healing. And so find somebody that you can talk to about that. Let's go out and live a life where, where, G, where it's clear under investigation that, our, that Jesus has us all. And that doesn't mean that we try to be somebody that we're not, but that the Holy Spirit is truly, authentically making us more like Christ, that we're surrendering to Jesus and we're making him our all in all, that other people would, would look at us and say, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Thanks so much for coming to worship this morning. Stick around for hospitality time right downstairs. There's a great spread of food and coffee and all that. So meet somebody new. If you want to pray with anyone, you're welcome to come and pray with me. But as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Church family, have a great week. You are loved. <laughs>